Welcome back to our exploration of the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative, their work, research, and paper and, and book that they wrote. Um, tonight is the last session, it's the fifth session, and we're happy you could join us. And tonight we have, um, we're going to be talking, the title is Embracing Nonviolence, Transforming the Church. And it's looking at the pastoral implications and the opportunities to promote and educate and implementation of, of nonviolence at, at the heart of the Catholic Church and also moving forward as the people of God. I'm coming to you from Casa Esther Catholic Worker House in Amara, Wisconsin. We're located on the original homeland of the Winnebago peoples. And founder of Casa Esther Catholic Worker House is Father Joe Matern. And tonight, so we'll move right into the presentations. We have John Hegel. He's a Catholic priest, psychotherapist, author of many books. And he is the chair of the Gospel Nonviolence Working Group of the Association of U.S. Catholic Priests. Also, we have, we're happy to have Judy Code. Since 2015, Judy has been the project coordinator of the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative. And prior to this, she was the communications manager of the Marinol Office for Global Concerns from 1995 to 2015. We wanna welcome both speakers and I believe Judy, you are beginning tonight. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Father John. Um, Father John and I talked a little bit about how to spend our time together, and we thought we could at least start with just sharing our personal story, what brought us to peace work, to nonviolence work. And I will share a little bit about the origins of the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative. I suspect many of you already know this story or you've heard it before, but I will share it again. So to start uh, again, my name is Judy Code. I worked for many years with Mary Knoll and I have been with Pax Christi International since 2016 as the coordinator of the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative. And just a little bit about my personal story, I was born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm a cradle Catholic. I'm from a very large Catholic family here in Nashville. Uh, for those who might not be familiar with the Catholic community in the South, for many years it was quite small and we were very close to each other. We um, stayed in our own little circle. I, I grew up in a little Catholic bubble here in Nashville. Um, and my parents were very faithful Catholics. They lived their faith. They had probably what would be a more conservative traditional of uh, faith, but they felt very committed to it. They lived it. It was part of their identity and that's how they raised their nine children. So I was very honored and blessed to be raised in that atmosphere. I attended schools taught by a community of sisters who are quite traditional and they emphasize a lot on piety and some of the traditional um, reflections of the church, less on the social justice component. I happened to go to Loyola, New Orleans for college. First, I discovered the Jesuits somehow and a new chapter in my Catholic faith was written and I learned a great deal from the Jesuits. Um, had some wonderful classes and teachings. I was led to join the Jesuit Volunteer Corps for a year, which really expanded my thinking, my uh, connection to my faith, to action, to the works for social justice, the, connect, the teachings of the gospel uh, and how we are to apply them to daily life and to um, structures and systems. And I, moved to Washington DC to spend another volunteer year with Sojourners, which is an ecumenical um, social justice magazine. And as I've said, I spent 20 years with Mary Knoll, which was really a gift. And especially because I had the chance 
to get to know so many amazing people of faith, very committed workers, missionaries, and serving in marginalized communities around the world, and was able to learn from them, absorb their stories, and my faith was buoyed by theirs and by their experiences. And in 2016, I was fortunate to start the work with Pax Christi International. I had become a member of Pax Christi USA and Pax Christi Metro DC in the 90s. I was invited into a prayer group for young adults at the time. At the time I was a young adult and we had a very vibrant young adult network. And I was fortunate to be invited personally by friends and that was a great gift for several years. It really um, affected me deeply to have this faith sharing with some of my, my friends. And I stayed involved with Pax Christi. I was a member of the National Council for six years in the early 2000s. And then I had this opportunity to start working with the International in 2016. So again, you might have heard this story about the origins of the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative. I think most of you know Marie Dennis. Uh, Marie and I are very close. We worked together for many years at Mary Knoll. I knew that she and others, I know Eli McCarthy, Gary Lee, who recently passed, who had been with Mary Knoll, others had been discussing the importance of integrating nonviolence into peace work and that nonviolence is distinct and different from peace and it's a unique component of our faith and they had been discussing how could nonviolence and the understanding of nonviolence as a way of life be integrated more into our faith and they fortunately found a welcoming ear with cardinal peter turkson who at the time in the mid to uh, 2010s he was the head of what was then the Vatican Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace. And he agreed that the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace would co-sponsor a gathering with Pax Christi in 2016. It would be a, a three-day gathering in Rome in April of Catholic theologians and peace practitioners who would come together and discuss how could nonviolence be integrated into the church? What was the possibility of moving, advancing nonviolence within the church? So that's that was my entree into this work. I was brought on to help with the logistics for that, um, getting the invitations out and getting the arrangements made and that sort of thing and helping with the planning. And we had a wonderful event. Uh, it was really groundbreaking. It was very moving. It was extraordinary in April of 2016. Uh, our final document was uh, a request to the church to advance nonviolence. And we can share links to that if you haven't. I think many of you have probably already seen it and signed it, endorsed it. And about two months after that April gathering, a small group of folks decided that to um, operationalize this work and make it a formal project of Pax Christi International. And we were sitting in the Marional office in Washington, DC and throwing around names. And I don't know who came up with Catholic Nonviolence Initiative and that became the name. And I was invited on to help coordinate it. And that's, it's gone on from there. And here we are tonight. So that's just the a beginning. We can talk more over the course of this evening about some of the events and activities that have been done in the last is it six years now. But, um, you know, the need to affect the church, change the church, uh, that that is the mission of the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative. Um, it is to affirm the mission of the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative is to affirm the vision and practice of active nonviolence at the heart of the Catholic Church. And we've really focused primarily on engaging the formal church, the structure of the church, 
obviously it's very important for individuals for for me certainly um to choose nonviolence as part of our own identity and our way of behavior in our day-to-day -day life with our family with our friends and coworkers um that is critical the catholic nonviolence initiative its energy has primarily focused on the structure of the church the t and how the church teaches and how it functions so i just want to clarify that a little bit and i'm going to just share a little bit about and and you all again you probably are well aware of many of these um, activities um, over the years what we've tried to do in order to engage the church uh, we know it's very important that the positions that we present are well grounded in solid theology and in real life experience we know that the church does value experience from the grassroots from the margins they want to hear from people who are living in areas of violent conflict they want their responses that is that is critical and we know that that's important to do so one of the first big projects that the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative did to engage the church is we organized five virtual, this was this is pre-pandemic, it was before everything was virtual. Uh, in 2017, we organized five virtual roundtables. These roundtables were small groups. Uh, it was, um, we selected, we invited um specific theologians and peace practitioners people who had deep experience who we knew um were very sincere and thoughtful and committed to this work and we invited them to work together for one year we asked them to work together for one year and to ultimately write a document on the theme of their group and so i'm just going to tell you there were the themes of the five groups one was toward a foundational theology of nonviolence. What is the foundational theology, Catholic theology of nonviolence? We know it exists. We know it's there. Uh, can we name it? Can we get it on paper? Um, another roundtable. What are the biblical foundations of nonviolence? We know that the written Bible, we know it's there. We know that this is what God is calling us to be. So show us the biblical foundations of nonviolence. The third, what would be a new moral framework of Catholic theology in the context of this violent world? And what is a new moral framework? You know, as John mentioned for, for many years, for generations, the Catholic church has operated with the just war theory, which has too easily been used to justify violent conflict. And we need a new moral frame. We need a new way to look at violent conflict and respond to it. And what would be that new moral framework? A fourth uh, roundtable was how to integrate gospel nonviolence at every level of the church, in parishes, in schools, in seminaries. How can all of these different uh, social groups uh, organizations within the church, how can they integrate nonviolence into their being, into their work? And then a, a fifth roundtable was simply, it's the power of nonviolence, the concrete, concrete ex examples of the experience, the principles, the methods, and effectiveness of nonviolence, because it's already happening. We know, we know it's out there. We know people are already engaging in nonviolent tactics. And we just wanted people to come together, name it, put it on paper. So we had five really wonderful roundtables. They worked for one year. Uh, each group came up with a final paper. And those five papers, they were done in 2018. Those papers became the basis of a larger document. They were put together. And that larger document was analyzed in a 2019 conference, also in Rome. We had another conference in the spring of 2019. 
It was also co-sponsored with the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace. Uh, was um, it does it no longer exists? It was morphed into the newly designed Dicastery for Integral Human Development. And so the the Dicastery for Integral Integral Human Development in 2019 agreed to co-sponsor with Pax Christi again, and it was a, a conference called the Path of Nonviolence towards a culture of peace. So that was April, 2019. The, the papers from the five round tables were put into one large document. All of the conference attendees, 2019 conference attendees, again, theologians, peace practitioners from um, areas of conflict around the world. They were given this paper to read, to reflect on, to comment, and we discussed it. It was, it was there were comments made, it, there were challenges raised, and the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative um, members received that information, went back, incorporated some changes, and from that, um, I don't have it with me, and I wish I had a copy. It's the book, Advancing Nonviolence and Just Peace in the Church and the World. So um, that became the basis of the book, which I think most folks on this call have been asked to study and reflect on. So that's how the book came about. And what we really hope is that the book will be read by Vatican officials, by um, leaders at seminaries, by parish leaders, that they'll take it to heart, that they'll consider the reflections, the uh, recommendations, the resources, and really start to implement it and make it part of the daily life of the church. Thank you, Judy. Uh, it's a pleasure to work with Judy and with uh, CNI, which I'm now a member of, and I'm, I'm just delighted to be part of this experience. I, I want to really thank all of you uh, for your interest in and commitment to this program and to this process. Uh, David and Casa Esther has taken a great initiative here, and I see that many of you. Uh, several of you at least, who are part of the gift, gift tonight are, are college students and university students. And we want to reach out to that as well as to all of you who are members of parishes and parish social concerns, justice and peace groups. So thank you. And it's a great part, great thing to be part of this. Uh, I want to talk about, as Judy did, sticking close to my own experience, our own experience, and inviting you to do the same. Uh, there's something about staying with our stories that connects to and relates to the wider stories. And uh, Thomas uh, Berry, the, the, the great eco-theologian, eco uh, wonderful man, who was concerned about not only nonviolence in general, but specifically nonviolence to the earth and the climate issue that we're all facing today, uh, once talked about what is causing all the polarization that's going on. And I don't have to talk about uh, polarization. We all know that from our experience in the church and culture in our society and in the world, we are divided and polarized. But he uses a very important phrase. He says that we are in between stories. And I think we're all in between stories. I am and have been. And I think many of us are in the process of that. And tonight, as we talk about the church, I'm specifically interested in how the church is in between stories. And we'll talk about what that story is, the story from basically uh, just war and peace as victory over violence by using violence to just peace, which is using and going back to and reclaiming the 
gospel nonviolence of Jesus himself. That's a that's a major shift in the in the story. And the, the great story that he's talking about is one that all of us are part of. Uh, in my own experience, I've experienced this, uh, or I've confronted this uh, challenge of shifting, of going through uh, from the old story and trying to get to the new story. I'm not, I'm certainly not there yet. And I think we're all kind of on our way. But let me talk about what I would call three turning points in my great story, uh, which is a you know, just a one part of all kinds of things. Think of your own story as I, as I describe this, as Judy was describing her story. Think of yours and think of your story in relationship to your family, to your church, your parish, to uh, your 7.7 7 billion and moving siblings in the universe and world today uh, and, and our planet. And beyond that, all of the people who are involved in the human community who are making this great shift from what I would call the war agenda to a national and international struggle for peace and for nonviolent peace. So the three turning points for me, I'll give you them to and then start about it talking about. First one is, I would call the old story, God, country, and the flag. <laughs> and the second one is called crisis and the emergence of the new story. And the third one is called reclaiming the story of nonviolence. So just to start with the old story, uh, God, country, and the flag. Uh, my first seven years of life were encircled by war. Uh, I was only nine months old, I'm sorry, eight months old, uh, when Kristallnacht of November 9th, 9th to 10th, 1938, that was the night that the Nazis and the SS went about with, with the help of a lot of paramilitary and broke into thousands of Jewish uh, shop owners and into their homes. And the shard glass that came out of that, crystal knock means broken glass. And it was a kind of prelude to what the Nazis called the final solution, which was six million and more Jews being killed in the Holocaust. So it was like, a, I grew up in uh, the, the Second World War, Pearl Harbor to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I remember uh, blackouts, sugar and butter and uh, other basics, gas being rationed. Uh, I was too young to understand much, but my family was, I grew up on a Wisconsin dairy farm, not all that far from where David is. And uh, in the process of that, uh, my parents had four boys. Uh, we were a close family. We were not in any way a, a perfect family. Uh, I was a, a, an altar boy, Catholic schools, the whole bit. And my parents were actively involved in Catholics. My mother was a member of the, the parish altar society, as they called the women's group in those days. My dad was a lifelong member of the Knights of Columbus. And they were conservative in their points of view as most Catholics were during the war. So they basically believe that war is evil, but you must engage in it to overcome a greater evil. So the goal of war is victory, peace through victory. Uh, and uh, that was a very profound experience. That's why, the Second World War, war was called the Good War. And the people involved in it were called the Greatest Generation. And that fundamental experience of, of victory through, or peace through victory, is one that is carried over in the Just War program, or Just War Theory, which is now well on to 1800, 1800 years old. 
uh, going all the way back to Constantine. So uh, the second crisis or the time in my life was crisis in the emergence of the new story. It has to, go, to do with going to college seminary in Catholic University in Washington, DC. First of all, it was a culture shock for me. Uh, I came from Wisconsin, which was basically European origin, white people, and going to Washington DC was like culture shock. I was in an entirely different experience of pluralism, of diversity. Uh, and I remember getting in on the number 80 bus and going downtown Washington DC the second day I was there. And for the first time in my life, I was a minority. Uh, there were more black people on that bus than I was. And it was a very interesting experience. Uh, part of, the, of shifting me from, from my first perspective. And it was a great upheaval for me. It took place on all kinds of levels. Uh, it took place in my college philosophy classes, in my graduate theology. Uh, the, the church itself was in between stories because I was there during the time of the Second Vatican Council from 1962 to 1965. I was actually there from 1958 to 65. I arrived uh, in September and in October, Pius XII died and John XXIII became Pope. And in January of 1959, we came back from classes and the, and the the uh, rector announced to us that he had called a second Vatican council. And we all looked at each other and said, oh, we kind of remember the first Vatican council in a long time. What's this going to be about? So it was an exciting time, but also a very time of turmoil for me. I, it was like a crisis of faith in my philosophical studies and also in theology. I would have one set of professors who were part of the old story and another set of professors who were part of the new story, which was a very helpful, but an exciting, but very confusing time of upheaval for me. Uh, so I saw the church in transformation. And by the time of my ordination in 1965, uh, it was like <laughs> I was involved in a great sense of great hope great expectations. Uh, it was a time of, of incredible enthusiasm for me. And I, I began my priestly ministry uh, 58 years ago, uh, excited and hopeful for the future, which leads me then to the third part of uh, my turning points. And that is what I would call reclaiming the story of gospel nonviolence. I had already had some professors and I had uh, people like Roland Murphy for Old Testament theology. And he was already uh, telling us about the prophets and their emphasis on social justice, biblical justice, uh, and, and talking about the image, the process of Jerusalem and the Israelites moving from a more constricted perspective of them being the people of God to all people being the people of God. And so I had some great professors. I had some pe people who were afraid of the Second Vatican Council and, and gave us a lot of resistance and pushback. But I went also then in the third part of my story, I went to graduate studies in Rome, which gave me a sense of universal church but also a divided church. What I saw there was resistance uh, as well as hope. I remember the first, the, my classes were in Latin, Italian, uh, mostly. Uh, and I had five different professors, one who spoke Latin and, and, uh, and Latin and, and French, one in Spanish, one in, in German, uh, one in English and one in Italian. And so by the time I understood my first complete sentence in Latin, it, that sentence was, if you want to know who has power in the church, only the Pope has power. And I remember looking at my classmate from Chicago, Tom Tyvee, and say, Tom, did you, did you hear that? He said, yeah. 
I said, that takes back the whole Second Vatican Council. What are we doing here? <laughs> it was like, uh, it was like running up against the wall. This is what I experienced as well as the process of, of great hope. When I returned, I was very involved in as a campus minister and chaplain of and uh, teaching philosophy in a small Catholic college, Viterbo College in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Uh, it's now a university, great, great place. And there I was uh, involved in the anti-war movement. Uh, it was the time of the Vietnam War. I uh, was involved also in the time of the circling of wagons and what I would call regression. Uh, there was a lot of times of regression uh, even though the, the bishops came out with a document on peace in 1983. Uh, and I had the opportunity in 1985 to go to Seattle with Sister Fran Furter, a Franciscan sister, at the invitation of uh, Archbishop Raymond Hunthausen. And Raymond Hunthausen became a mentor. Uh, he still is, uh, even though he's dead now for four years. Uh, I look to him as someone who continues to carry on for me uh, the great hope and the great experience. So beyond that, uh, I've ex continued to experience reclaiming uh, the gospel of nonviolence, especially through the Seattle experience, through now, through since 2010, through the through the Association of United States Catholic Priests. Most of us are kind of old Grundies like myself, but uh, who, who believe in Vatican II and its mission. And in the process of believing in that, uh, we, are, we are an older group like most renewal people are. Uh, and yet the Gospel Nonviolence Group, and I became chair of the Gospel uh, Nonviolence Working Group uh, in uh, 2019 in the spring, and uh, have been working with that since, and have become members of Prox Christi and Catholic Nonviolence Initiative, where I am very appreciative in coming to know Judy Code and uh, Marie Dennis and Eli McCarthy, and uh, lots of other important and significant people in the peace movement. So that's the, the challenge for me now. Briefly, what I see happening is that how do we move the church as a whole, the, the people of God, how do we move from the old story to the new story? Because uh, we're, we're not there uh, in any way. Uh, there, there's an incredible gap in the, the Catholic church between gospel nonviolence on the one hand and just peace theory on the other. Uh, in uh, the last election, 52% of Catholics voted for former President Trump. Uh, and though they are very large and importantly focused, including the bishops on pro-life, they don't seem to understand that pro-life also takes into account nonviolence and all that goes with misogynism homophobia, racism, and all the other forms of systemic violence. So the, what I would call, instead of peace through victory, military victory, we are now in, in looking at how do we get to peace through the victory of justice and a just peace. That's the challenge. Uh, I want to uh, especially hold up the work that the uh, CNI has done, the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative, around uh, following through on the historic conference in, in, in 2016 in Rome. And uh, I do have the book. This is the book uh, that is next to the word of God is my, my body make them. It, it, is, it is the vision that will move us from the old story to the new story about peacemaking. Uh, it will move us out of the just war theory 
that as Judy points out, is usually used uh, to justify war rather than to look for just wars, uh, is if there is such a thing. And I think Pope uh, Francis is very clear today in saying that the just war theory is not valuable or possible anymore because war is no longer feasible in any case. Uh, we've got to find a different way to resolve conflict interpersonally, personally, and culturally, and in the church, and most of all, internationally. Uh, we don't have a lot of time to do this. Probably the climate change and uh, violence through war and systemic violence are the two most pressing issues facing humanity. And unless we wake up to that, uh, we don't know what the future is going to be like at all. Uh, I, I want to talk just a little bit in the time we have left and then open it up. We're very interested in your personal experience as we have been talking about, as well as how you view what would help transform the church or move the church, <laughs> if transformation is slow, move the church from the old story to the new story. And again, what's the old story in, in the case we're talking about here? It is that you find peace through military victory. The new story is that you're only going to find peace through biblical justice and authentic gospel nonviolence. That, that's simple, but it's very complicated in terms of how do we move the community of God's people to come to believe this and then to live it. It's a way of life, not just a set of concepts. It's not a political uh, move in terms of, a, it's not a political tactic. It's not a cultural a stance. It is ultimately a deeply gospel way of life that we're talking about. Let me give you four examples briefly of how I have experienced the collision of the old and new story and the emergence of the new in parish experience. When I was a pastor, the first issue was around uh, when I came to the peri a large parish in the Midwest for, for a large parish would be 1,100 families. Uh, when, I, when I came to the parish, there were flags in church, Vatican flag and American flag. And the Knights of Columbus, for every time there was a celebration, they would come in with swords. And so I said, uh, I tried to listen for the first year, but after the second year, I said, we're not going to have any flags in church because even the liturgical uh, architects and people who talk about a liturgical environment say that's not proper. The church says that. Secondly, flags give the impression that the church and the Vatican, or the church and the state, uh, operate out of the same set of values. Well, that was a major issue that I uh, almost, uh, I had petitions taken up to remove me, and there were all, <laughs> a whole set of problems that came with that that I don't need to belabor. The second one was uh, that happened uh, in March of 1980. I had been each year going uh, on the March for Life around uh, in the area in, during January because I was trying to see uh, basically the, the sacredness of life as Cardinal Bernadine talked about it as uh, a seamless garment, uh, very much in terms of the gospel nonviolence itself and what Jesus taught. Uh, what I found was that people would welcome me to go uh, on the marches for life, but when the 1980 when Oscar Romero was killed in March and the women martyrs in December 2nd of that same year, each time I had a march, I helped organize it uh, to protest the United States politi politicization of war and they're uh, obviously selling out to the right wing uh, powers that be and military powers 
in El Salvador. Uh, again, I had a lot of resistance and, and a lot of upset and a lot of chaos in the parish. Uh, the second thing I'd like to talk about is in Call to Action 1976, uh, I was privileged to be there because I was a director of Office of Justice and Peace at the, at the time. What happened was that the whole church met there in terms of a synodal-like uh, communication with the people of God to listen. And then all of these were brought together in Detroit in 1976. And it was a very progressive, it was a shift from the old story to the new story on all levels of the church. And we were all excited, pleased and hopeful as we went away from that event. But the bishops were frightened by what was presented there and they turned basically and quietly tabled everything. It got nowhere, which makes me worried about the synodal process that we are now going through. I hope the same thing does not happen. A third thing I want to talk about briefly is the Eucharist for gospel nonviolence. We have to find ways. How do we bring the newly emerging story of gospel nonviolence to families, to parishes, well, to dioceses? Let's face it, to chanceries and to bishops, to colleges and to uh, universities. How, how, do, how does this new story begin to take place, which is already happening in many places? And many of you who are probably watching these, this series of five programs are part of that emerging new story. And we're very grateful for that. But uh, that is not an easy thing. How do, more than that, how do we bring the new emerging story of gospel nonviolence to our sacramental formation and to the way we celebrate sacraments? How do we bring it to the adult experience of initiation? How do we bring it to our catechesis, to our liturgies, to our social concerns committees and parish leaders? How do we do that? Well, it's amazing that in this book, <laughs> there are some amazing suggestions for how we do that, that fit very well with what we are doing in the Gospel Nonviolence Working Group as well, how, how to carry that about. One of the things that we have done is to actually write, compose and propose a Eucharist for Gospel Nonviolence. This was done in 19... Or, I'm sorry, 2021, 20, and uh, we proposed it to the association. The association passed it, and we proposed it to CNI and Pax Christi. And Judy was very instrumental through Pax Christi International in having that uh, Eucharist for Gospel Nonviolence translated into French and into Spanish. So it is an international presence. And uh, that's an incredibly experience of, of what can happen. So it's now available and how we make, we've, we've petitioned the Vatican and the USCCB, that's United States Catholic Conference Bishop of Bishops, to consider adopting this Eucharist for gospel nonviolence. And I, I'm, I will make it available, uh, let you know how to get this in our discussions that follow afterwards. Uh, but uh, look at this. There's a fourth one that I'm not going to get into and may come up in our discussion, which is the treaty for the prohibition of, of uh, nuclear weapons, which took place actually in 20, I think 17 by the United Nations. And it has now been adopted by uh, 85 countries who have actually adopted it, and there are more who are signatories on it. And the first signatory on the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons was the, the Vatican itself. That's little known among Catholic people, and I think little known among a lot of bishops. And uh, we have a proposal in, in the uh, Gospel Nonviolence Group to bring this to the bishops as a way of perhaps bringing pressure on Congress 
and obviously the church to begin to move to the new story of gospel nonviolence. <laughs> 